Welcome to the Bible Forum. I'm Warren Sprouse. We're here every Sunday night from 8 to 10 Eastern Time, live. But we're online, probably where you're watching it now. <laughs> we have the videos on our website, thebibleforum.net. We have videos posted on our YouTube page and our Facebook page. But you are more than welcome to come here every Sunday night live and join the folks in the chat room and interact with what's going on. I want to talk to you this night about the new hope for Israel. To give you some minimal background, according to the Jewish News Service, there, the Palestinians in Israel have rejected every peace deal presented them in 1937, 1947, 2000, 2008, 2014. On July 24, 2000, the day that Camp David talks between Israeli Prime Minister Ehud Barak, Palestinian Liberation Organization Chairman Arafat, and U.S. President Bill Clinton broke up. Sarah Stern of the Jewish News Service is a reporter who authors this piece that I'm about to share with you. She says she was in the audience at a prominent Washington think tank, the Washington Institute for Near East Policy. She was there when Attorney General Eliakim Rubenstein, who had been with the Israeli negotiating team, came to address the group. Rubenstein told his audience, quote, I can look every one of you in the eye and I can assure you we went as far as any responsible Israeli government could possibly go. In fact, he continued, what we offered was so breathtaking that many would argue that we weren't acting like a responsible government. What we offered to the Palestinians was, one, a shared sovereignty of Jerusalem with the Palestinians maintaining control of the Temple Mount, or the Harem El Sharif, they call it. Secondly, that we would give back 95% of the West Bank and all of Gaza. And thirdly, a land swap within the Negev for the 5% that would not be returned. In addition, we would dismantle all of the Jordan Valley settlements, which have always been our eyes and ears to the east. And finally, we were offering a right of return for thousands of Palestinian refugees, refugees from the 1948 war, as well as a compensatory package for those who could not be absorbed. You remember 1948? <laughs> These people abandoned their property and ran off because their leaders told them that there was a war going to occur and they were going to destroy Israel and then they could come back and they would have all of this back again, only it didn't work that way. Israel took them out. And these people have never been able to come back. He went on to say, we felt that if we just made Chairman Arafat an offer that was so good he couldn't refuse it, he wouldn't. In fact, many could argue that this offer was so generous it wasn't responsible not for us, at least, to offer it. Well, he didn't say yes, and he didn't say no. He simply walked away from the table. Now, that was almost two decades ago. After that offer came an even more generous one in 2008 from Israeli Prime Minister Ehud Olmert to Palestinian Authority Chairman Mahmoud Abbas. This included giving the Palestinians the entirety of Judea and Samaria, they, we call it the West Bank, along with Eastern Jerusalem, and placing the old city and the Western Wall under international control. Again, the Palestinian leader walked away from the table. Each time, the response to these exceedingly generous offers was met with a renewed round of violence, resulting in more than a thousand Israeli fatalities. The Palestinians, he says, have never once accepted the right of the Jewish people to have a sovereign state. 
They have never once abided by the basic premise that the Oslo Accords were conditioned upon the total abdication of violence and incitement to terrorism. Yet the same tired, old, stale thinking was recycled. The international community, as well as the United States under every other president, would come back with a more and more generous offer for the Palestinians. Each time Israel was denied the chance to have defensible borders, something that is absolutely essential, particularly in the volatile Middle East. That was then, but this is now. And there's a new plan on the table, and it's different. The current plan, being called the deal of the century, is being put forward by Israel and the United States. It gives Israel, for the very first time, real defensible borders with the natural topographic boundary of the Jordan Valley, something vitally important in an age of increasing Iranian hegemony. It does not erase the Jewish people's history or claim to the holy sites. It simply demands that the Palestinians recognize Israel as a Jewish state. It demands that the Palestinians abolish the incitement in their textbooks. It calls for the end of the revolting pay-for-slay program, which incentivizes terrorism with greater payments for the greater number of Israelis they murder. And it calls for something the Arab world has found very difficult to do since 1948, except the reality of Israel as a Jewish state. It would give the Palestinians 70% of the West Bank and 50 plus billion dollars in investment in an economic infrastructure to build institutions of democracy and an educational path so their people can climb out of the cycle of poverty and self-imposed victimhood. So how did they respond? Well this time Abbas would not even take President Trump's phone call calling him a dirty dog, among other worse epithets. But also this time, things are different. This time the Palestinians will have to learn that the patience of the international community is not infinite. For once, time is not on their side. After continually walking away from the negotiating table and resorting to violence, they have come to the point where their bad behavior will not be rewarded. They will have to learn that Israel is here to stay and cannot be wished away. The Palestinians will have to learn that by refusing to negotiate in real faith, they're losing, both figuratively and literally, the ground they have been planning to stand on. And why now? Well, simply because we have a president who's willing to stand up for that which is right. But now the issue is how long it will take for Netanyahu to get this underway. Experts are predicting his defeat in the next election if he doesn't get this thing going. Israel has begun to map the Judea and Samaria lands that Israel will annex, according to the Prime Minister, something he said just yesterday. We are already at the height of the process of mapping the area according to this Trump plan. It will become part of the State of Israel. It won't take too long, Mr. Netanyahu said. Netanyahu's statements occur less than two weeks after Pre President Donald Trump unveiled his Middle East peace plan, which gave American approval for such Israeli annexation, paving the way for the next Israeli government to actualize its campaign. Promises, the campaign promises. Today, we're looking at February 9th, 2020, it was reported that we are little more than a week out from President Donald Trump's presentation of his vision for peace. In that week, people have proclaimed him and his team anything and everything from the Messiah to Judas. And the truth is, he and his team are neither. President Donald Trump, his advisor Jared Kushner, his son-in-law, and U.S. Ambassador to Israel David Friedman are loyal U.S. patriots and the greatest friends Israel has ever had in the White House. Their statement, not mine. 
They went on to say, let's remember where we were as recently as December 2016. We were abandoned at the United States, United Nations, and the terms of the UN EU style peace plan were dictated to us by then U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry. That was certainly a low point in international relations for our great state of Israel. Since then, however, the Knesset uh, has nearly filled up. We, uh, not the Knesset, the Kinneret, the Sea of Galilee. I'm not good on my Hebrew. Uh, the Sea of Galilee has nearly filled up. I didn't know that it was shrinking, but apparently it was going away. And we haven't figured out how to thank Trump, Kushner, Friedman for that yet. But we could. But if we could, we would. We have become energy independent in no small part because of our partnership with an American company, Noble Energy, in a deal brokered by Jordan and Egypt that could not have been possible without the tireless assistance of the United States. The President and his team recognized Jerusalem as the capital of Israel, moved their embassy there, got out of the Iran deal, recognized Israeli sovereignty over the Golan Heights, stopped funding the United Nations Relief and Works Agency for Palestine refugees in the Near East, declared settlements, their settlements, illegal, and so forth. Then the President presented his peace plan for the region. Let's understand what, it, what is in the vision and the importance of working in lockstep with the administration to achieve our goals. Number one, security. Unlike the terribly flawed Iran deal, this plan is not based upon hope or faith. Rather, it is based upon enhancing Israeli security control and responsibility throughout all phases of its implementation. Number two, Jewish homes. This administration has been clear, one cannot Judaize Judea. Our roots and our homeland are quite literally in the name. Each and every Jewish home and their environs will eventually become part of civilian Israel. This means being able to build throughout Judea and Samaria, as in Haifa and Jaffa, Tel, Tel Aviv and Bet Shemesh. Thirdly, Jerusalem will be considered by the greatest power on earth, the undivided and eternal capital of Israel. This has been something for which we have been yearning for literally 2,000 years. I might add, and Trump is the first American president to say so. Number four, everyone is aware of the reality on the ground here. Our neighbors are not ready for peace. They may never be ready for peace. Each and every day we wake up and we pray three times a day for peace. We strive for peace, but we will not die for peace. This vision changes the entire paradigm of how the world looks at this supposed conflict. Instead of asking, demanding, that we take more risks for a peace that will probably never mature, this administration has been extremely clear that peace will come if and only if our neighbors make dramatic changes. In order to achieve peace, they must demonstrate they will stop acting like Iran and begin acting like Canada. If and only if they cross those these hurdles, which we are highly doubtful they ever will, can we negotiate with them. To be clear, we want peace. We have always wanted peace, and this is the only vision that can that actually acknowledges what it will take to get peace, no matter how difficult it is to imagine occurring. In the weeks since this vision has been released, most of the world has declared that this is something serious to be considered and negotiated. There are notable groups throughout Europe and Middle East, among those in support of the U.S. proposal, while even more noticeably are those against Iran, Hamas, the Palestinian Authority. Do you know why the Gulf countries expressed support for this vision? Do you know why the Prime Minister was welcomed regally in Uganda, where he met with the new leader of Sudan? We are a cutting-edge 21st century regional power, but we have two secret weapons. One is God, and the other one is our special and unique relationship with the United States. Everyone around the world wants a piece of each. To hear people, regardless of rank and station, 
complain about the difference of opinion over the timing or recognition is not only embarrassing, it's shameful. This vision was presented as a vision, not a finalized plan. If our country chooses in the future to enter into negotiation based on this vision, we should not interfere. But while the Palestinians cry hysterically, let it not be our camp that looks and sounds unhinged. Let us set an example for the entire country. We, the undersigned, will work to get a government elected that will maximize the opportunities presented by this vision while safeguarding against those who would take this plan and use it as a platform to weaken us in every possible way. We pray every day for peace and know it will only come when we are strong on our own and the world sees no daylight between Israel and the United States. This vision accomplishes all of this and more. Thank you, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, for forging such a strong and strategic relationship with President Trump, Jared Kushner, and Ambassador Friedman, the best friends we have ever had. It is signed, signed by the mayor of Efrat, the mayor of Ariel, the mayor of a town I can't pronounce, mayor of Elkanah, mayor of Carnel Shomron, mayor of another one I can't pronounce, and mayor of Oranit. This is the commitment of Israel and the United States to try to come to some point of peaceful living together in that region. Will it happen? Well, I believe that the projects that have been proposed will happen. But I also predict that it will come to blows. The Arabs never negotiate with Israel. That's their cardinal doctrine. And that's why going to these different places and meeting with presidents and others making these deals, Arabs have never agreed to them. They won't even talk about it. So you can't negotiate, you just have to keep functioning. Keep in mind, the Bible says in the latter days there will be armies that come against Israel from the north and from the south and from the east. And it will get real dicey, so dicey, that the Lord Jesus Christ himself will return to the earth to settle it. Until then, we're going to keep getting these reports. And we're going to keep seeing this activity moving slowly, carefully, but certainly toward an already reported end. Pray for the peace of Israel.